Pro Motocross Riding and Racing with Ron Lachine. Hi, I'm David Stanfield. This is the USGP course here at Carlsbad, California. Carlsbad's been known for one of the greatest racetracks, and this right now has turned into a hotbed of racing for Team Kawasaki as they are riding at race speed. Ron Lachine is here with his teammates. They're gonna give us an insight on how to go faster, how to go safer on the big green machines called Kawasaki. Jeff Ward's here. Eddie Warren's here, along with Bader Manet, and their team manager is gonna give us a little insight. Look for some good tips from Roy Turner. Now let's get racing. In the beginning, the French combined the words moto for motorcycle and cross for cross country. It was then, in the summer of 1947, that the FIM used the new term motocross and sanctioned the first motocross to nations. Pro motocross changed dramatically in 1964 when Joel Robert won the 250 World Championship on a two-stroke machine. After Torsten Hallman won the 250 World Championship in 1966, he paid a visit to America. Hallman's appearance inspired many Scramble and TT riders to pursue the challenge of motocross. In the early 70s, Kawasaki began their motocross development effort. Meanwhile, the AMA began its 250 and 500cc national championship series. And in 1972, 30,000 people paid to see motocross in downtown Los Angeles. It was Mike Goodwin's original Super Bowl of motocross. The United States hosted its first ever Grand Prix Championship race. It was 1973, the 500cc USGP at Carlsbad. And in 1981, Americans began their domination of the World Team Championships. The following year, the surging American motocross movement was highlighted by Danny Laporte and Brad Lackey, winning the 250 and 500cc World GP titles. Ron Lachine earned Rookie of the Year honors in 1983, and two years later, he became the 125 National Outdoor Motocross Champion. Jeff Ward spearheaded Kawasaki's race program with the 125 National title in 1984. Then, in 1985, won both the 250 National and Supercross Championships. Today, Kawasaki's commitment to produce a highly competitive line of motorcycles has made them one of the most dominant forces in the world of motocross. Kawasaki's success is a direct reflection of its U.S. motocross team efforts, their training, and their bike tuning. This looks like a very serious effort. You guys have rented the Carlsbad Raceway track here uh, for a couple of days. You've got four trucks. Does that mean you've got your four riders and they're here uh, improving their skills, but more importantly, uh, improving the, the bike and tuning it up? Well, we have, we do have four riders here today, yes. And one of the riders is one of our pro support team riders for next year, Bader Manet. So our three main team riders are Jeff Ward, Ron Lachine, and then Eddie Warren in the 125 class. Ron and Jeff are in the 250, 500 classes. We work in cooperation with the factory. They come up with a lot of ideas. We come up with a lot of ideas and hopefully end up with enough items that when you refine everything and, and match and tune everything, you end up cutting those half a second a lap off, quarter of a second. You know, each, each little difference you make, if you can get out of a corner or through a complete corner, maybe a quarter of a second quicker. It doesn't sound like very much, but when you talk 20 corners on a track, all of a sudden you've saved 10 seconds in a, in a lap you know, or five seconds. I mean, it adds up. And one second a lap maybe doesn't sound like very much, but when you talk about a race that's 20 laps, you're 20 seconds in the lead. A quarter of a second, you know, each, each little difference you make, if you can get out of a corner or through a complete corner, maybe a quarter of a second quicker. It doesn't sound like very much, but when you talk 20 corners on a track, all of a sudden you've saved 10 seconds in a, in a lap you know, or five seconds, I mean, it adds up. And one second a lap maybe doesn't sound like very much, but when you talk about a race that's 20 laps, you're 20 seconds in the lead. 
If you're talking about the engine, you're talking about uh, different carburetors, different jetting specs on it, different expansion chambers, different port timings in the cylinder, different cylinder head configurations, different compression ratios, uh, different valve timings on them. Uh, clutches, transmission ratios, outside gear ratios, just a balance of everything in toll of the whole engine, you know. Maybe one engine uh, actually feels more powerful, but because it's more powerful, you spin the tires more and you actually don't get moving as quick, so your times are actually worse, even though the engine produces more power. So it's not necessarily just producing more power. The whole thing has to be balanced properly so that you get that power to the ground and the motorcycle accelerates. You know, obviously, if you put a jet motor in the thing, it's got more power, but you're not going to go faster because the tire is going to spin so much. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to take into consideration when you're trying to make your lap times quicker. Being a factory rider not only means you're expected to win races, but you play an important role in race bike tuning. Here's three different laps of Jeff Ward as they dial in a new suspension setup. Obviously, when you're talking about a rough track, I think it's suspension. The suspension's real key here. You go out there and do a couple laps, come back in and report to uh, the team manager. Yeah, we try different things. We usually stay out for a number of same laps, maybe four or five, take times each lap, and then we'll come in, try something different, and go out for the same amount of laps and have them do the same thing. And then we can you know, look at the paper and find out what's working the best, sometimes something that feels better on the track, but lap times may be a little slower, so you really got to do a lot of different things to get the right power and everything you like in the machine. So it's not necessarily a, a verbal communication back and forth, they're actually timing you out there. You're going out there at race speed. Correct, yeah, we're going 100%. That's testing. Practicing seems to be easy for me, and testing, you come out here and you've got to go 100% because you got to make it as a race pace. Sometimes the bike works differently at a higher speed than it would maybe at a practice pace. Fast and consistent riding is priority in testing. You can't be erratic, especially when the stopwatch is on you and the mechanics are doing minute adjustments on the suspension compression settings. The pro rider knows his machine and how it works. The communication between rider, mechanic, and team manager is essential. Training. Ron Lachine's motorcycle training began early in his career, when he first started riding at the age of eight. At the age of 16, he turned professional, finishing seventh in the Supercross Championships and fourth in the 125 National Outdoor Championships, and was the unanimous Rookie of the Year. At the age of 17, he finished fifth in the Supercross standings and second in the 125 National Outdoor Championships. At the age of 18, he became the 125 National Outdoor Motocross Champion, finished third overall in the Supercross Championship, and was a member of the winning American team at the Motocross to Nations. He's called the machine. He loves to get big air. Ron Lachine seems to ride with no fear, and his natural ability amazes everyone in the sport. Being a professional, looking at it as a daily job, whether you look at it seven days a week or five days a week, you're going to go out and you're going to practice by yourself. Are you going to run a 30-minute moto? Are you going to run two 30-minute motos? What, what would be a, a good, hard routine for you one day? Well, on the hard days, I like to go out and uh, put in at least two 35-minute uh, you know, motos. And then after that, I like to go out and I just do a little bit of play riding, playing around, jumping rocks or you know, climbing hills and stuff just to keep it interesting. Um, I usually, I have a hill by my house, and I think it's about a 10-mile hill, and I haven't made it to the top yet, but my goal is to get all the way to the top, and every day I try to get farther and farther up the hill. And I also have a doctor who sets up a program for wind sprints to get the maximum amount of intensity you can get, because racing is real intense, so you have to get training intensity, that's where it comes from. Strong heart, cardiovascular system, the, the whole series. Now, you yeah. talk about this 10-mile hill. You're talking about not running up, but riding up this hill. No. A hill climb? This is, this is running up. Oh, this is running up this, this is hill. Running up. And you haven't made it? No. Try going slower. It's, it's... <laughs> First of all, I have the same bike. What I practice with is what I race with, because they're, sim they're both the same, obviously, and that helps on race day. Uh, the things I practice on when I practice are just braking and better throttle control and just getting stronger. That's where it's all at, is being in shape. And how do you do that? Do you uh, swim, bike, run? 
Have you ever jet skied before? Kawasaki makes the incredible jet ski. Yeah, I do quite a bit of jet skiing, as a matter of fact. I, I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun, but, it, but it's a good workout also. Yeah, rise is the most important thing. And I do quite a bit, but I try to do only, only enough where I don't get burned out. And I also do bicycling and some running. I lift a few weights also. A motorcycle training, you go out to the track. Do you, uh, if it's a serious day, do you run two 30-minute motos? I do, I do that every day. I, my first moto is usually 40 to 50 minutes long. I ride as hard as I can. Then my second moto is a, a moto that I, I go out and ride as hard as I can at the beginning until I, I start to get real tired. And I back it off a little bit, but I, try to, I stay out there for a good 35 minutes. And it's not at my 100% race pace because I've just went 20 minutes longer than my a moto before. So I've almost put in three motos into two riding sessions which really helps out for the second moto at a national where, you know, you got 30 minutes, but, you know, you're used to that 40 minute and it'll make it go by a lot quicker, a lot easier. Then, right. then after that, then I go home and do my, my cycling. I usually do 200 to 250 miles a week on my bicycle. And then uh, I try to run 25, 30 miles a week. You go to Texas one time and they, and they tested you on machines and... It was at the uh, LA Health Institute, Los Angeles. What'd they find? found that the motocross athletes were the one of the most fit, fittest that they've ever put through the, the institute. And you were one of them? Yeah, I was ranked second at that time, and I wasn't even near the shape that I'm in now. I'd, really? I'd like to go back and test it. What can beat a motocrosser? A soccer player? Uh, I, no, I'm not sure who they had through there. I think it might have been a marathon runner just because of his, in, his oxygen intake and his level of uh, his body fat. But uh, soccer players are ranked right up there because of the same so they go the same distance, and there's no rest. Well, I don't know. I personally think the motocrossers, it, especially the cream of the crop, the top five or six guys. And I saw you pulled in today with your bike. Also, your, uh, what is it, 12, 14 speed? You've got yeah, a serious my road, road bike. bike. I do a lot of bicycle riding on the road now and a lot of running. I'm kind of getting into the triathlon mode right now. A surprising number of top U.S. motocross riders are using biathlon and triathlon to train for motocross. Swimming exercises the entire body, particularly the shoulders and the arms, while maintaining a continuously high heart rate level, while heart volume is greater and blood pressure is lowered when immersed in water. This is the Santa Catalina American Race Challenge. Bicycling has become very popular and when competing has some similarities to the world of motocross. Technique, strategy and tactics all play a role in the final outcome of a bicycle race. By mastering an efficient cadence while bicycling, you can travel long distances at a challenging speed and the end result is increased leg strength. Running is an endurance type of exercise which decreases blood pressure, especially diastolic pressure, while increasing blood volume and greatly enhancing the ability to improve your oxygen intake. Running also increases the number of blood vessels encircling your heart, as well as giving you great muscle tone. Diet, body fuel? I eat the basic good stuff. I stay away from all the candies and sugar and just eat a lot of, I'm a lot into a lot of salad and stuff like that, and a lot of fruit and the basic good, good meal. I stay away from meats though. You stay away from sweets, eat a lot of whole grain, pastas, and Fruit, fruit during race days, a lot of light meals, no real heavy like steak for it to sit in your stomach. And you drink a lot of water the day before so you don't get dehydrated for the next day. Mountain biking has become a serious sport and is an excellent way to shape up for motocross. And what better way to test your mountain bike skills than a friendly race at Carlsbad? What goes up must come down. So over at the Carlsbad downhill, a very vocal group of spectators waits in anticipation.
racing. In this Supercross qualifier, watch Jeff Ward. This is how he races to win. have one thing in common. They're winners. For the majority of their racing careers, they've been winning races. When factory riders are racing, they are always looking for more speed. They pick the fast lines, and they're consistently fast lap to lap. And they can ride on the edge of disaster if need be. They are comfortable at speed. They're used to going fast, whether on the ground or in the air. Professionals are durable. They're survivors. They have to be. Their careers depend on their physical well-being. And they have a winning combination of metal confidence physical ability and racing skill. A professional motocross rider sets goals and is dedicated to reaching those goals. Any tips for the young rider or the old rider, somebody that wants to get into recreational racing that uh, has that urge to race competitively and hopefully can pick up some sponsors? Well, I think the, the first and what you should always remember, just make it fun. Don't make it a job. Um, I don't know, don't, don't go over your head and get hurt because if you get hurt, that's not fun and it sets you back. I just think have as much fun as you can have and if you're really enjoying it, then you'll just keep going and going and you'll get better and better. I always stay down and watch the racing. I never go back up in the truck and sit there and just come down and, and get ready for the main event without seeing anything that's going on because jumps change, people do different things and if you haven't been watching somebody, they're going to pass you. What you want to do is get a really good start. Whoops. Let's try that again. OK, one more time. Watch this one guy's technique. Five second card goes, and the gate's not going to drop for a full five seconds, so you don't have to be all amped out. To kind of count down to where you know, so the five seconds are almost up. Then you, you know, you're right at that, that ready for the, the gate to you know move. And you're not, you know, staring at it for ten seconds and blink and it drops. So you know, kind of precisely within a second when it's going to go down. Supercross jumps are designed for spectator enjoyment. The guy that pays fifteen dollars for a reserve seat loves to see the high flying competition. The track builders have three considerations: a safe track, a competitive track, and an exciting track. The names of some of these man-made dirt obstacles are quite entertaining. You've got the doubles, the triples, the quads. Then there's the T-bone jump, the slammer, the rockers, the drop-off, and the ghastly gorge. This jump was named the launching pad. Negotiating jumps like these, you need the right combination of height and distance. First, take a different line if there's a rider in front of you. Then, select a gear that gives you pulling power on your approach. Control the mid-air angle of your bike with the help of your throttle or your brakes. Keep your legs in the middle of the bike. Slightly lift your feet off the pegs while grabbing the bike with your knees in mid-flight. You might consider downshifting to mid-air, setting up for the next turn. Concentrate on a smooth landing and get back on the power immediately. Survival. This rider gets out of shape negotiating this double jump. His approach is angled when he gets air off the first jump. He can't control his unplanned cross-up and loses it. This guy comes up three feet short on his double attempt. Case is a big time, and he and his motorcycle do an unusual forward roll. This rider lands really hard, first on his rear tire, then his front fork slams him. His trajectory sends him into the hay bales.
Rider number 223 is moving up quickly. He changes his line as he double jumps because of the rider directly in front of him, but he didn't notice the other two riders right off to his side. He comes across and the rider in the middle gets pounded. Jeff Ward, plate number one, talks about passing. Well, usually if you get a bad start to get the most uh, amount of riders is on the first couple laps. Usually going outside, not following somebody in the corner because they may fall, and you know, you'll, you'll bag two or three riders at a time. And once you get through the first lap and everybody settles in, they get going a little bit faster, then you just start uh, you know, finding their weak points and getting them as quickly as possible so you can get up with the, you know, the front runners and make a charge at them. And you know, sometimes it comes on the last lap, and sometimes you, know, you get them earlier, but you just gotta keep going, anything can happen. Take different lines. Do what you have to do to pass. Just don't follow the leader. Once in the lead, keep an eye out for late race challenges. Dispose of lappers immediately. Don't give them a chance to race with you. Once you have a good lead, ride at your own pace. Stay with your proven lines. Don't do anything risky. And at the end of the moto, you'll naturally become tired, but keep up your race speed, because here comes the checkered flag. When you win big, it's customary to throw your goggles up into the stands. And if it was a really big win and you're really excited, you throw your helmet up to the crowd. Then there's dealing with your fans. Most of them want autographs. This lady didn't have a piece of paper, so Jeff had to get creative with his magic marker. Motocross venues, local, regional, national, international, specialty, and supercross. Local racing, 19-year-old Bader Manet riding bike number six in this race competes as a Kawasaki Pro Support rider. I asked Bader to explain what Pro Support meant. Pro Support is a lot you get um, all, all the support. I asked for 100% support from the factory, which they give you the bike, they give you the mechanic, they pay your way to the races, um, they, pay, they pay for all the expenses that consist in your racing. And um, all you have to do is just go out there and do it, except you don't get a salary. Then I asked Bader how he would make money. The way I would make money is from the race and from bonuses that come from Kawasaki Motor Corporation. Bader races with a variety of riders, especially at local tracks, and the competition can be just as intense as a major race. You still have to have the go for it attitude. Uh, I race here because a lot, lot of riders, you know, they. They race on the same track every week, every week, and there's a lot of good riders that are pretty lo that are local riders. So I go out and I tune up and get some good practice in on the local tracks around, and it keeps me in tune for the national series. And you always bump into the local hot shoes, and they would love to knock off a pro support guy. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, there's always someone there wanting to take your spot, and always someone there wanting to beat you. So you go out there, and then you just go for it. If you're fast, one of the hazards of racing is passing slower riders. Sometimes you're forced to take a different line, and you never really know what's gonna happen. I went around to go around the outside, then I cut, cut to the inside, and one of them tried to block me, thought I was another intermediate, and I tangled on him, so I came out and hit a little, seen a little hole, and I went out into it, 
and went over the jump. And as soon as that, I heard another motorcycle come and land right on me and just put me in a tumble. That tumble, were you OK? Were you able to continue riding? Um, yeah, I was OK. I stood up and finished, but it shook me up a little. I ended up, I think, third overall. At local tracks, you can find Egg McMoto's stock and modified burritos, as well as women drivers. If you're lucky, you'll get to see Tina. She's the blonde with the torn jersey. The motocross mom might be there. She's an animal. And there's the girl that's been cleaning up at motocross tracks all across the country. She's very photogenic. Say cheese. Now, squeeze your motorcycle. Her name is Mercedes Gonzalez, and she's the women's national motocross champion. The women that have to compete against her know that she's tough to beat. She seems to do everything right. She concentrates at the start line. She forgets about everything that's going on around her. And the idea, well, is to zero in on the whole shot. When the gate drops, get the traction to the ground, go straight, go fast, and go forward. If you get the whole shot, still ride aggressively through the first turn and survive without a mishap. Mercedes does just that. She's usually out in front. Eddie Warren about Mercedes. Yeah, I've seen Mercedes ride quite a few times, and I know her real well. And I also know Lisa Aiken, which is a former women's national champ. And I got to hand it to those girls. They really put up a fight with the guys. They, they beat a lot of the guys, and I give them a lot of credit. They seem to have a lot of support within their ranks. It's not like uh, every man for himself or every woman for himself. It seems like a real team effort, and they're not on a team. They're just everybody's so supportive. Yeah, they. Um, I don't know, they just do a really good job and they try really hard, you know. And every, every sport has women's, women in it, so I think motorcycles should too. The, the uh, beginner intermediate riders that uh, possibly watching Mercedes Gonzalez, what can they learn from watching? One thing that I notice, she's very smooth. Yeah, that's one important thing, you have to be smooth. Um, you don't want to be erratic and crash all the time, which a lot of riders have bad habits of doing, so I say you can learn something from everybody, so if they watch her, they'll obviously pick up something. What's her forte? What's what's her personality like? Is she out there for uh, uh, the win all the time? Does she put on a race face like guys? Well, when she's racing with the guys, um, she really doesn't put on the race face. She goes out to have fun and just, you know, do as well as she can do. But when it comes to racing with the women who are in her category, she puts on the race face and she wants to beat them awful bad and she usually does. Into its 11th year, the popular Golden State Series in California attracts the factory pilots. Both midwinter races in Florida and California are bringing the serious competitors up to race speed as they go into the opening rounds of the Supercross Series. Here are the pros, race with the future pros. Regional racing.
I asked Kawasaki's team manager, Roy Turner, about the AMA production bike rule. Everyone from the amateur to the top factory pros are supposedly using the basic machines. Is there any difference in the racing over the previous years? I don't think it really makes a lot of difference so far with uh, the things we're allowed to do by the bikes according to the rules. We're, we're pretty much free to change the things we need to change in order that the bikes are up to a level that the factory bikes were up to. Um, production bikes are up to such a high level now anyway that if people have the knowledge, they have the availability of items from aftermarket suppliers, they can make the bikes as competitive as we can. So there's really not a lot of difference. I mean, uh, you know, we're not at any less advantage than we were with factory bikes. If you look at the testing that we've done this year from our, our last year race results and then going to a production bike this year, uh, the lap times are still decreasing, the bikes are gaining more power, they're handling better, so it's, it really hasn't changed too much. We're just It's kind of an ongoing thing and it's still progressing. Many riders say that Jeff Ward's strengths are good starts, physical conditioning and determination, and they're right. Motocross is frequently described as featuring the best conditioned professional athletes in the world. America's national championship racing features 125, 250, and 500 cc classes, and considered by many to be the toughest competition in the world. I asked Roy Turner about consistency in national racing. It is consistency, that's for sure. You know, you can't fall down and get 18th one moto and win the next one and expect to take the overall, and that's uh, an important part of it. But when you're talking the top-level riders, you know, it's it, consistency. It takes more like a 2-2 two -two to win. You can't get usually a 4-2 or a... 4-1 and take the overall because the competition at the top level is just too stiff. So you, you have to think and uh, the second moto is actually the most important one. You, you can win the first moto, do everything you need to do, but if you don't win the second moto, you're going to lose the overall. So, you know, it, it's nice to win and, you know, you split points even if you go 2-1 and you get second, but, you know, it's nice to have that overall under your belt too. Those feel good. International racing. The umbrellas come out for a flood of competition. Rain or shine, the Europeans wage a fierce battle for Grand Prix points, even when they visit America. The prestige of a Grand Prix title sells a lot of motorcycles. So why doesn't Kawasaki send Jeff Ward to compete in the European Grand Prix events? Well, you know, I think it's money, you know, they make they make more than enough money here at the States, why leave home? One good reason, USA's top guns leave town when they're chosen to race the World Team Championships. RSVP, an invite they can't refuse. Europe is into pomp and pageantry, a long tradition of flag waving and nationalism. The best in the world race for their country and personal pride in the annual motocross to nations. Roy Turner 
had this to say about Ron Lachine's performance. It was difficult for Ronnie because, of course, riding on a 125 and all the motorcycles running the start together, the 125s were going to suffer. So he, he started at the back of the pack, both motos, uh, and he had to go through all of the traffic. And, you know, it was tough. Stribos was tough. He was riding a 125, but Ronnie came out with the top points in the 125s, and, and Jeff took uh, both the moto wins on the 250. Uh, and on the 500s, uh, I think David took second and third or second and fourth, but totally I think the points were enough, they were enough that we won the overall title. But it was pretty exciting, you know. I know, it, I think even if Ronnie could have been up there at the beginning on the 125, that uh, you would have seen him right with the 250 and 500 machines going around the track as far as lap times are concerned. So it's an interesting concept. I think they should do the start a little bit different, you know, give the 125s a little bit of an advantage uh, off the gate, but uh, it, it was good, you know. Uh, it's interesting concept. It's, they can see there's not so much difference in lap times. What makes, uh, uh, what makes it dangerous? Was it a track that was dangerous or was it just so many riders on the track? Well, there's a lot of riders on the track. It was a fairly high speed track, high, high enough speed, in fact, that a 500 did hold the advantage there. It was a 250 or 125 could make up the time going into the corners, but coming out of the corners, the, the 500s just had the power down the straightaway and you couldn't, you couldn't drive the corner hard enough to get around them. You could get it right up with them, but they'd accelerate away on the straightaways. And, and uh, roost was uh, pretty, you know, hard rocks, and it, it just made it difficult on the 250 and 125 as far as trying to actually win the race. Ron Lachine's performance was quite impressive, especially when you consider the tough competition. Well, Europe can be a, can be very fun and also be a you know kind of a hazard out there, you know, because. Uh, a lot of the European riders, you don't really know who they are, especially the year I rode that, the trophy donations, you know, there was 500 riders, there was 250 riders, and I was riding a 125, and uh, it, it kind of kind of got crazy out there, you know, I'd try to pass a guy, and I'd pass him in the turn, and he'd pass me back down the straightaway because he had such a fast bike, and uh, I had a lot of fun. It was a good experience for me. I really uh, enjoyed going over and being part of the team for USA, and uh, I'd love to do it again. The final point stands, as expected, a resounding win for the Americans on seven points. Holland a second with 12, West Germany third on 22, with Italy in fourth place, seven points behind on 29, and Great Britain a remarkable result in fifth place on 31 points. Supercross racing. All new Supercross 86. A bold racing breakthrough explodes in San Diego Stadium. Rolling this Saturday night on a new track designed to make a grown man cry. Race fans come to their feet. Hometown factory pro riders Glover, Johnson, and Lachine smash. The motocross invasion from the north on the toughest San Diego Supercross track yet. With lots more jumps, they're coming this Saturday night at 8. TV commercials bring out record crowds to watch stadium racing. 70,000 thrill seekers jump at Anaheim for Coors Supercross Racing. A hyped up, flipped out extravaganza as Sports Illustrated, the best race ever. For eight years, Anaheim Stadium has sold out for the world's best motorcycle racers flying over gigantic dirt jumps. This is the Mike Dunn original you've been hearing about. Not an exhibition, an all-out million-dollar championship race with every factory superstar. Saturday, January 31st, we guarantee Supercross is better than any race or your money back on the spot. The world of supercross racing is possibly the most exciting type of motor racing ever presented. Roy Turner thinks supercross racing is quite a show. It's a little bit of a circus, but it's, uh, you know, it draws a lot of attention and it's, it's important to win supercross races. The thrill of supercross. It's thrilling, and you know, selling out the crowd and everybody going to see every move you make and and uh, the jumps and just everything is so intense out there and and it's just a sprint race, you know, it's a start and then you go wide open from start to finish and it's exciting. You can feel the presence of 70,000 people. Oh 
Oh yeah, when you make a pass on the lead, you know, you hear them, they just, you know, they scream and cheer, and you hear it when you hear it when you get past, you know, you know you you got past definitely, and uh, you can hear when a rider's coming through the pack sometimes because you can hear some passing going on. If you're out in the front, you can let's say somebody passes a guy in second, you hear the crowd, so you know somebody just made that move, and it, you know, and then just hearing them cheer for you coming through the pack really gives you incentive. The status and visibility of motocross racing in the U.S. has increased dramatically ever since Mike Goodwin introduced stadium racing back in 1972, and he called it Supercross. Ronnie Lachine tells us what Supercross racing does to him. Oh, it really hypes you up out there. Uh, you know, you, a lot of people say you can't really hear the, all the fans yelling and uh, everything, but you know, I, I think you can. You know, I can anyway, and uh, it really hypes me up and gets me going and uh, makes you a little crazy out there. Team Kawasaki hopes this video heightens your interest in this growing sport and that if you ride or race, you do so safely and professionally and get the most enjoyment out of the dynamic sport of motocross.